Ladies and gentlemen, in this Red Gaming Tetacom video, Intel are going to be unveiling their Intel Core i7 Broadwell E HEDT chips in 2016. So, already we're starting to hear the first details, and I imagine some of you are pretty damn disappointed to hear it's going to be 2016 for these chips. But the HEDT, also known to its friends and buddies as high end desktop processors, are going to be, as I said, codenamed Broadwell E. Now, <clears throat> these processors are going to be built supposedly on LGA 2011 V3 packages. In other words, they're going to be compatible with existing motherboards based on Intel's own X99 Express chipset, though it probably will require some BIOS updates. Now, the good news is it's going to be very much and, well, maybe not so much good news, but it's going to be very much like the Ivy Bridge E compared to Sandy Bridge E. In other words, it's going to be more of an incremental update. It's not going to be an entire new uh, architecture. So, we're going to be seeing the Broadwell E's compatible and built from 14NM. Um, and they're going to, of course, feature between 6 to 8 cores based on the Broadwell architecture. Now, supposedly, you're going to be seeing this wrapped up rather tenderly with 20 megabytes of level 3 cache, which is pretty nice. And it will be compatible, pin compatible with Haswell E. Um, and in theory, this should mean it will be a quad channel DDR4 integrated memory controller. There is a slight difference, however. Whereas the Haswell E. Um, for the entry level parts had 28 uh, lane PCIe. It's possible that for Broadwell E, this isn't going to happen. Um, this isn't clear yet, but it might be that Intel are just going to can this and go with a 40 lane standard PCIe, PCIe interface for all of their parts, for all of their silicon. Now, once again, just to reiterate, this has not been confirmed. Supposedly, the TDP of the chips will be rated at 140 watts, and if slides are anything to go by, it will support for overclocking in Extreme Editions and KSKUs, which is obviously a good thing. Supposedly, it will feature integrated discrete graphics, unsure just how powerful they're going to be at the moment in terms of benchmarking. The real thing here, though, is that Yes, it's going to feature hyper-threading, yes, it's going to feature 8-6 to six cores and all of the other stuff that we've seen, but really, for those of us who are have been in the HEDT high-end desktop space for some time and we've been wanting something a bit shinier, well, we're out of luck. Um, Intel are basically holding back for some time now. But the real oddity with all of this is, despite the fact that Broadwell E has slipped to 2016, supposedly Skylake S... I'll repeat that one more time because I've got a bit of a cold. Skylake S is sampling already. This is according to various Chinese sources. Once again, we're not sure of the exact release date of Skylake, but it's supposedly going to be 1151 chips. And from what we can gather, um, the sampling of these supposedly has turbo clocks of about up to 2.9 gigahertz and a TDP of around 95 watts. Now, we don't have complete and utter translations yet, but apparently DDR3 and DDR4 memory will be supported. So we're in this really odd position right now, um, because as high-end desktop users... The <laughs> I would, I would go as far as to say that we've had a couple of reasonably good la launches, like Intel's 5000 series, pretty good, but prohibitively expensive for most people. And to be honest with you, for a lot of tasks, like let's say gaming, it hasn't really been probably worth it because at the moment games just really aren't taking 100% use of, uh, making 100% use of the cores anyway. But of course... Most of this is going to change over the next 12 to 18 months when DirectX 12 becomes a big thing and everyone's using it and we get much more powerful GPUs and more to the point, we don't have the archaic dragging of the previous generation consoles just weighing down and um, making programming game engines that bit trickier because of course that means you have to cater for not only 
the old architectures of the consoles, but try and make games as awesome as possible for the next generation of not only consoles but PCs. Um, obviously, we've got some titles like, say, Assassin's Creed Unity, which is just catering solely for next generation consoles and PC. But there is still quite a lot of titles which are trying to uh, walk that very thin line between both generations, and it's not working too well in some cases. So, just to finish this off, Broadwell E is looking to be a very interesting piece of technology, and it will, of course, be a jump over what the current you know chips already have. But for those of us who want a massive leg up and a massive boost, it's probably not going to be that. It's not going to be like an entire new architecture. Skylake is supposedly taping out, but while it can support DDR3 and DDR4 and so on, the problem is that we're hearing that it might not support overclocked versions, which is going to be sucky, quite frankly. And so Intel are, well, I wouldn't say screwing over high-end users, but making it so high-end users are going to be scratching their heads and wondering what the best upgrade path is going to be. And then, of course, we've got situations in the GPU market right now, which are just, the GPU market is pretty damn volatile. Um, prices have just gone absolutely crazy over the last couple of months. Just to give you an example of what I mean, in the GPU section alone, um, NVIDIA's graphics cards in high-end, for example, the Titans have just dropped in price like a stone. And then you've got um, AMD's R9 295X2. Um, I actually wrote a buyer's guide today for the graphics cards, and it's funny because back in June, the 95X2 won the a dual graphics card um, recommendation from me, or from RGT as a whole. And then, uh, today, you know, I looked at prices, doing price checks and stuff, and yeah, it basically dropped like $600 in just a couple of months. It's just crazy, and some of this, of course, is down to Maxwell, some of it is down to the fact that they're no longer being used up all the time by Bitcoins, and so AMD have managed to push the prices down. But certainly now, you're getting chips of pretty damn good performance. I mean, you could start getting uh, GPUs now at absolutely crazy prices. And CPUs are the same, um, which is really good in my personal opinion. I mean, just to give you an example of what I was uh, referring to here, you could get like an R9 290 for like $270-ish. Certainly if you shopped around, you could get it even cheaper. And uh, CPUs are becoming that same type of thing. I mean, you can get some really high-end deals pretty cheap. So it's going to be very interesting to see how AMD are going to respond to this. I'm hoping they're going to respond pretty well. As I mentioned um, in a previous video, they have changed their CEO. Um, and the new CEO is definitely has a much better engineering pedigree. So there is a lot of hope and optimism that the Intel's next CPUs are going to be very... Uh, sorry, AMD's next CPUs are definitely going to be a lot more competitive to Intel. And to be, be honest, it's not like AMD's CPUs are bad. Uh, Price-wise, they're good. It's just that they don't offer the high-end performance. So for the bleeding-edge you know, PC setups... They're, they, they're not competitive at the moment, but for the mainstream, they're certainly good enough, but uh, AMD certainly do need to kind of push that up a bit. So hopefully, by the time Skylake and Broadwell E do actually end up launching, we're going to at least hear news or have a concrete evidence of what AMD are planning as well. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care, and bye for now.